the recording. And um, I'll start with, uh, with uh, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Miriam Rabi, and I manage the SDGs Today program at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, SDGs Today was launched in partnership with ESRI in the National Geographic Society in July 2020 uh, to advance the production and use of real-time and georeferenced data for the SDGs. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be moderating uh, this webinar today. Um, I'm just going to check and see. It looks like Jeff hasn't joined us today uh, yet. Um, there we go, looks like Jeff is tuning in. Uh, we'll uh, kick off today's webinar with a keynote uh, by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, a director of the Center for, for Sustainable Development at Columbia University and president of SDSN. Uh, then we'll move on to a panel discussion about the need for timely data on school locations, uh, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and the challenges it revealed and exacerbated regarding access to education. Uh, and the final segment will include two technical demonstrations by our partners, um, the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, uh, and Esri will walk us through the two platforms you can use to map a school and participate in uh, My School Today. Uh, and we'll have some time for questions at the end, so feel free to submit your questions to uh, the Q&A box. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me all right? Greetings. I can. Great. I know you've stepped away from a conference to be with us, so thank you for making the time to share your insights. Um, the floor is yours. Oh, great. Thank you. Let me just... Yeah, can you open up my video? Let me see if I can do that. Hmm. Are you able to turn on your video now? Uh, let's see. No. Oh, wait a minute. Just saw you. Good. Great. Greetings, we can see everybody. You. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mariam. Uh, thanks to all the participants of my school today. This is uh, such a timely, interesting, and uh, important project. I wanted to uh, step out of uh, the meeting that I'm in, in in Cyprus right now to greet everybody and congratulate you and uh, urge you to move forward. We have, uh, of course, a uh, multiple crises, but one of them uh, is the education crisis. In fact, Secretary General Guterres uh, in his uh, agenda that he set forward for the UN highlighted the parlous state of education today in the COVID period, uh, and even before COVID, with hundreds of millions of kids not getting the educational services that they absolutely urgently need. Uh, COVID, of course, put hundreds of millions of more kids uh, out of school and out of reach. And there are many processes underway, rather urgent and desperate processes to try to close the, uh, the access uh, chasm right now, uh, whether it is, uh, of course, making it safe for kids to go back to school massively scaling up a uh, training of teachers and getting kids uh, and schools online connected with digital devices uh, so that uh, they can benefit from the online environment and also as necessary learn uh, online uh, if the schools are closed or if classrooms are connected my school today is a is a very innovative and important uh, part of that effort. And I also want to salute uh, UNESCO and UNICEF uh, and ITU for the GIGA initiative, which is closely related, which aims to get all schools and all learners online, uh, in line with Secretary General's call for universal digital access no later than 2030. And for education, it really needs to come uh, much before that. Uh, my school today is 
uh, not only helping in that by uh, even helping uh, ministries of education and district officials know where the schools are, uh, have them geo-referenced, increasingly understand the nature of the facilities, their capabilities, their gaps. Uh, do they have digital connectivity? Do they have electricity? How many teachers? How many classrooms? Size of students, enrollments, and so forth. But doing this in two ways that are extremely important. One, today. My school today is about timely information. Uh, and second, participation, because my school today is about uh, uh, bottom-up participation of students all over the world, especially with the focus in Africa, to participate in this geo-referencing, to learn GIS uh, uh, systems tools, uh, to be able to uh, use the information that is uh, gathered for learning uh, uh, about uh, their local uh, SDG challenges uh, and learning uh, how to use uh, statistical and uh, geographic geo-referenced data. So I see this project as extremely pertinent and important. Uh, next year will be a global summit on education. Uh, I really want my school today to uh, be an important contributor to that summit uh, and working closely together with the rest of the UN family uh, so that we're contributing to solutions. Uh, I would like uh, my school today to be working closely with the ministers of education. We have a fantastic partnership in Ghana where the minister told us on our most recent online meeting how important this information is for his policy planning, for his strategy of allocating resources uh, between schools and sharing resources among schools and how important uh, this uh, initiative is for uh, participation and gaining new knowledge as a pedagogical device as well. I believe that everybody should learn GIS tools the same way that uh, they need to learn spreadsheets and basic statistical tools. Uh, and uh, this project can be a great learning device as well. So Mariam, uh, thanks to you for the leadership and to uh, colleagues uh, around the world that are participating today. I very much uh, look forward to the new breakthroughs of this program. And of course, uh, I'm very eager to help in any way to support your very important work. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me uh, join briefly today. Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for joining us. Uh, I think we'll be addressing a number of the points that you raised in today's panel discussion, and we hope Great. to expand our collaboration with other stakeholders to help get every school on a map and every child in, in a school. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, good. Th thanks a lot. Best wishes, everybody. Thank you. Um, okay, so moving on to the panel discussion, uh, we have three wonderful uh, panelists joining us today. We have uh, Naroa Durutula, uh, the Giga Technology Lead at UNICEF, Raya Ahmeda, uh, Assistant Lecturer at the State University of Zanzibar, and she's also a Youth Mappers Regional Ambassador, uh, and Lorian Innes, a Business Development Manager at Africa GeoPortal. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, the first question I have uh, for the panel uh, is about how digital access has become an inherent part of uh, education access for many education systems during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, and how does this impact a student's need for access to a physical education uh, facility? Uh, Naroa, would you like to start? Sure, uh, and I'm not able to start the video. Uh, Let me see. If otherwise, it's fine. Change. I can just go ahead. Uh, but yeah, first of all, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm Nara Zerutuza. I'm, I'm part of the GIGA team uh, where I lead, as uh, Miriam said, our technology work. And uh, GIGA is an initiative to connect schools to the internet 
and through that connect students to relevant information opportunity and choice. And, and maybe rather than focusing on the impact that COVID has created in the access to, to these physical spaces that uh, maybe other, other members of the panel might be able in a better position to speak about that. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna speak about the impact that it has created in access to content, in access to education and how uh, schools can still play a key role within that. Uh, we believe uh, in GIGA, we believe that schools are not only centers for education, but are centers for entire communities. Uh, on top or in addition of learning, it's it's, they are places where vaccination campaigns happen, where people go to vote, where community members gather after school hours uh, and uh, access different types of experiences and different types of content and services. So within that context, uh, being able to locate schools, have a deep understanding of where they are, where are these uh, center points for communities, and using them to, again, uh, distribute access to learning and distribute access to uh, relevant digital services, it's, it's very key. And that's where uh, GIGA's first step and where we are really putting lots of efforts is in creating a global map of school locations, because without knowing where schools are, you cannot connect them to the internet or you cannot deliver any kind of services and the resources that they, they need. So that's really the very first uh, effort or thing that we are doing on our end. You can go to uh, projectconnect.world and uh, you'll see the, the public map of school locations that we are creating over there. We have almost 1 million schools mapped and the goal is to map every school in the world by uh, 2030. And uh, within that, uh, my school today, it's a, a really important effort for us by engaging with community members, by engaging with the crowd to help us support this type of efforts and uh, among each other, create this comprehensive, complete data set of school locations around the world. Thank you so much. Um, I think all the panelists will be able to share the video now. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, Raya, what are your thoughts about this question? Raya, you're still muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, important event. I'm glad that you have invited me. Uh, I'm Raya Idris Ahmada, an assistant lecturer at the State University of Zanzibar, but I'm also a Youth Mappers Regional Ambassador, and I'm also currently the Swiss Youth Mappers Mentor. And luckily, this uh, I'm very interested in this my school project because uh, we are currently doing a similar project, the school mapping project in Zanzibar, funded by OMDTZ and also supported by Liquid Telecom. And the idea is at first, of course, it was to provide school location of all the schools across Zanzibar. But then when we met uh, with the Liquid Telecom, they were interested also to find ICT data available into those schools and find the means, proper means to provide internet connectivity across the schools. Of course, they are doing it a uh, project across Africa. So for our, our case, we are doing it in Zanzibar. So I have seen uh, like we are having a similar objectives and aims, uh, the, the, the ones you're doing. But coming directly to the question uh, that how does this uh, impact a student's need for access to a physical education facility? I will talk uh, personally based on my context uh, in which uh, most of the time internet accessibility is very, we lack internet accessibility. We don't have a reliable internet access. So uh, moving on into online teaching, it's a very, uh, had for us. Some of the schools, like mostly private schools, um, started some initiatives during the school closures or the um, lockdown in, for uh, this uh, pandemic, but it failed as uh, most of the students were, some of the students, of course, most of the students are not able to buy gadgets uh, themselves. They were using their parents. But in addition to that, uh, the, the, the lack of reliable uh, internet access was a hindrance to, to development of that. So uh, in this, I can see uh, an impact uh, and a need 
to access physical education facility at a long uh, run though we are using digital um, content and digital or online learning and digital tools we will still need uh, school facilities for the students to be there and access the the the, the i mean access the online materials to access the lab facilities to access internet uh, facilities etc but in addition to that it is not only based on the school's location but what are the facilities currently we have in those locations in those schools i mean because there are some some of the schools with the uh, computer labs but you find that there are some computer labs but they don't have access to internet but in addition to that we have gone uh, to rural areas where the electricity is not accessible so you see it has a large impact and as for this project we are working directly with the ministry of education we have a full support from the Ministry of Education. And they have some, of course, they, they need some of the data. And the, this data, in the long run, they will use it in the uh, Ministry of Education um, management information system, which will help them in uh, making uh, new policies, in regulating where to put new schools, where to, uh, if there's a need to close one, or if there's a need to put a uh, school into a, a certain area. So that's how what I want to, to talk about. Yeah, thank you. And sorry, for those who doesn't know about Youth Mappers, Youth Mappers is an initiative. Uh, it's a worldwide initiative. Uh, it's uh, basing on uh, uh, student-led chapters in which uh, uh, university students are mapping. They have mapping initiatives. They create maps, but they also uh, students are trained and given skills to to be mappers themselves. So they are doing uh, that, and they are working under the Open Data Initiative. So they map the different uh, facilities and dif different uh, things, and they put that into OpenStreetMap. Thank you. Thank you, Raya. Uh, Lorian, would you like to go next? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us to speak today. My name is Lorian Innes. I'm regional manager for Africa for ESRI uh, and on the panel today uh, representing Africa GeoPortal. So for those of you who don't know, Af Africa GeoPortal is an ESRI initiative to support the geospatial community in Africa. And Africa GeoPortal is an online platform completely free for single users. And really what we're providing is three things. First of all, we provide tools for mapping, spatial analysis and field data collection. And we provide learn lessons, and this is a very important part. These learn lessons are really for anybody like a student, a teacher, or a geospatial professional to get up to speed with how you can use the tools, how you can map and analyze that data. And lastly, Africa GeoPortal provides data itself, of course, uh, and the data consists of many different sources. Uh, it includes data from ESRI, but it also includes data from other global organizations like NASA, the World Bank, also OpenStreetMap, obviously, uh, data from FAO uh, and others. Next to that, we also have data from regional organizations like uh, RCMID and country data, as well as data provided by the larger user community within Africa. So Africa GeoPorto in a nutshell is all about providing geography to the community for development. And it's been used for many different goals and topics, including conservation, health, especially during the COVID-19 crisis last year. Uh, but also, of course, in support of uh, SDG calls like uh, equality and uh, quality education, as we're talking about uh, today. So coming back to your question um, about the uh, access and, and the, the remote learning. So we, we know and we've seen that a lot can be done remotely. Uh, but we also know that a lot is lost when things are done remotely, right? The shared experience, you know, interacting with peers interacting with the community at large and um, you know we feel a hybrid approach is probably something that absolutely will work uh, especially in the field of geography for us you know we can do a lot, a lot remotely but what we're missing is that the students go out and learn in the environment right that they speak with people about the problems and that they apply technology to help with practical applications uh, so this is why as we, we try our best to provide you know the learn lessons as well as the technology uh, and that technology can be used remotely so it can be used online but it also can be used in the classroom but also more importantly outside on mobile devices and within the community 
And all these tools are provided uh, through Africa's Geoportal. And I, I totally agree with the previous two ladies, you know, the, the schools really can function as communities. And that's a very powerful role uh, for, these, for these youngsters going into the future. Thank you so much. Uh, the next topic is about um, using kind of a bottom-up approach to improve data on school locations and how that approach supports existing education-related data and decision-making processes at a local uh, level. Um, Raya, would you like to start and share your thoughts on that? Okay, maybe we can, um, Naroa, Naro, would you like to start? Um, and then we'll go back to, to Raya. Yeah, um, yeah. no, the, the video is working. Um, I think that bottom-up approaches are definitely super helpful and also complementary to existing centralized uh, approaches that we traditionally work with. Um, the, the way we, we've been gathering our data, it's combining different approaches. And I, I do believe that maybe a, a single approach won't solve the entire problem, but definitely will complement each other. And uh, each different approach brings a different uh, value to the, to the problem. So uh, usually the, the data that's gathered by governments, it means that um, it's gathered, it's not very timely. Uh, usually these data collection efforts happen every few years. Uh, they are very resource consuming, both time wise, but also uh, other types of resources as people have to travel to the physical locations, gather the data. And uh, another challenge with this type of approaches is that oftentimes data is uh, inaccurate as well. And there is no easy way to validate and ensure that the data that you are receiving it, it's accurate. And if you identify uh, errors or accuracy issues, then it's again very difficult to fix them and correct them. Um, Bottom-up approaches allows us to work with, with the people, with communities, with the crowd, and directly collect this data, making it um, coming directly from the ground, uh, getting the needs and understanding what are the needs, and uh, listening what people have, have to say. It also adds the local ownership piece, and uh, by promoting or by supporting this local ownership of the data, uh, you also uh, create an incentive for community members to make sure that the data that uh, they share, it's relevant, it's accurate, and that it's up to date. So uh, for us and the way we've been uh, interacting, we've, we've had few crowdsourcing initiatives on our end as well. Uh, it's that we, we see this type of initiatives very valuable to complement existing data, to validate, and fill some of the gaps that we identify in data that already exists. Uh, because overall, there are many initiatives that are happening at the same time, and uh, sometimes there are duplication of efforts. So we really want to avoid duplicating efforts and making sure that the, the work that we do and that the efforts that we put on the ground are uh, to, to complement. So on that, we've had we have a mapping game, a crowdsourcing mapping game that we've built to help us crowdsource the validation of data. As I said earlier, oftentimes data that we receive from official sources, it's not accurate. And we even find locations that when you start plotting them or putting them on a map, either they are outside the country itself, whether they are in a place with no buildings at all. So we are using crowdsourcing to, to validate this data that we receive at, at scale. And I think that the, the effort that my school today is doing, it's even, it goes beyond that because it doesn't allow you only to validate data, but it also allows you to gather new data that you didn't have before and maybe go to communities and places that either they have informal schools or they have uh, types of facilities that wouldn't necessarily be included in official formal data sets. Thank you. Um, Raya, let's go back to you if you can hear me. Okay, maybe not. Uh, Lorian, um, over to you. Sure, sure, thank you. So the, the bottom-up approach, um, I think the first law of geography really supports this. Uh, the first law of geography is uh, that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. 
So from a community perspective, it means that people that are more involved in what happens in their own community. And if you then bring that back to education as a parent, you know, you want the best education for your child and you want to understand, you know, the, where the school is, what are the facilities that the school has? Do they have water? Do they have internet? Do they have electricity? You know, what are their social distancing policies? Um, how do I get my child to school? You know, what is the road infrastructure like? Uh, are there any dangerous crossing? And this is all information that's really important and relevant for, for um, you know, parents to know, uh, but also, of course, for the local uh, community to then make those decisions. Um, so as a parent living in that local community, I really have a vested interest in making sure that the authorities have the right data to make the right decisions for those schools. And also from a student's perspective, you know, learning is easier if you can relate to it. So using geospatial data is not just about the school, but also looking at geospatial data within the community really helps them improve their learning uh, and really brings that back to life and how important it is for the entire community to have access and to work with this data and to, as um, Mariah said, have ownership of that data. So yeah, absolutely agree with that statement of a bottom-up approach. Thank you. Um, let's uh, try one more time. Raya, can you hear me? Okay. Um, maybe we can we can come back to Raya. Uh, she may have. Sorry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, I had some issues with my PC. I don't know what happened. But uh, well, uh, coming to the second point that you have uh, raised about the bottom-up uh, up approach. Uh, it's the uh, best way to go. Uh, it starts with the community themselves. And uh, those people are the ones with the ground uh, truth information, uh, rather than uh, like uh, asking this uh, uh, remote mappers. So it's a, a, a very good idea. But in addition to that, uh, that we are also, um, uh, we are also, making the community feel uh, like participate they, they feel um, they feel welcomed to 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 support the initiative and to to contribute to the data so it's an a, a thing and they, they they will be able to share that uh, openly and uh, so in addition to that uh, this information is really helpful uh, especially for the parents to understand uh, where their children, for example, should catch their bus to school, maybe if uh, is it near to their homes uh, so that they can uh, either walk and what about the walking routes and building locations. So if, uh, if to see if there's anything that can danger their students. So uh, it's really important. Uh, and in, in addition to that, uh, it's not that time consuming. Once you have your gadget, you have the, the tools, you can simply, even a student can map uh, his or her own school. So it's a, quite a good thing, yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question I have for the panel is, um, can you share your experience or maybe an example on how uh, information on school locations can help highlight gaps in quality education opportunities? Um, Lorian, um, let's start with you. Sure. Well, there's many different ways that location information can help highlight gaps, right? And the map that you have put out there uh, showing the walking distance to school broken down by gender and number of students shows a very, very clear picture. And that really highlights huge inequalities uh, across the continent and within countries. But uh, as, as Raya was just saying as well, it's not just about um, you know, some of those key data set like distance to school is also about ability to get to school and to stay in school, right? So you also need to look at things like income levels in the area, household size and demographic in general, things like employment rate, uh, the quality of the education at the school, uh, as well as the education levels within the area, all of this has an impact on it, uh, as well as the infrastructure at large, as uh, what was Raya was mentioning as well, you know, the, is there access to wood, electricity, internet? Uh, just to give you a very personal example from my experience, um, you know, in England, students get assigned a state school, a free education, roughly based on their proximity of the house to the school. So, and schools themselves get rated based on how well the students are doing. And if you then start mapping the location of the school, 
bring in the ratings of that school and bring also in the income levels in that area, you'll find that there's a direct correlation between the income level in the area, the house prices, and how well the schools are doing in that area, the quality of the schools. And really what I wanted to show you there is that it's not just about the data, right? It's about the ability to utilize that data to then perform analysis and provide actionable information. Um, so it's really about providing the data with the tools and the technology all in one place so people can actually utilize it and, and, and create you know, actionable information on it. Thank you. Uh, Naroa, would you like to go next? Sure. I already spoke a little bit about how relevant, important the data and the, the mapping work. Okay, I think there might be a connectivity issue there. Um, Raya, maybe we can uh, move on to you and then go back to Narola when, when she's back. Raya, can you hear me? Okay, looks like we may have lost, uh, lost two of our panelists. Um, Let's just give them maybe another minute to see if they can reconnect. Otherwise, we can move on to the next section and then come back to them when they're connected. Raya, are you able to hear me? Looks like uh, uh, there's some issues with the connection there. Um, what we could do is maybe move on to um, the next the next uh, segment of um, the webinar today, and then we can come back to to the panelists uh, with the final questions uh, once they're back online. Um, so uh, the next section of the webinar, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Dio Kibude uh, from OSM Uganda and project manager for Hot Uganda uh, and Jason uh, Saul, uh, global manager for schools um, at Esri. Uh, they're going to teach us how to map schools directly in OSM and use um, My School Today's ArcGIS Survey 123 to georeference a, a school. Um, and also answer a few questions um, about the uh, school facilities. Um, Dio, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, good afternoon and good evening for those uh, coming from the different time zones that we have. Uh, my name is Dio Gracia Stribide, and I want to be sharing with you a quick deep dive in how you can actually map um, the school on OpenStreetMap. Let me quickly share my screen and let's get started. Uh, do let me know when you can actually see my screen. I've uh, done a couple of uh, presentations before, and you find yourself you not know, teaching. We can see team. your screen. Amazing, amazing. So yes, um, for those who are actually new to OpenStreetMap, OpenStreetMap is basically a, a kind of Wikipedia platform for uh, where people can actually edit and uh, add features, geographical features, schools, health centers, buildings, and roads, uh, and as well as schools that we're going to be sharing these days. So um, you just type in OpenStreetMap.org. Okay, come to the, the sleepy map that we have here. I obviously had around Uganda, uh, but obviously works across the world. Uh, so come in wherever you want to actually add a school. And for this demonstration, I'll be showing you one of the areas with schools that I'm very proud of about. Kilometers uh, outside Kampala called Wobblesy, uh, but you just zoom in very closely until you find this icon here at the top uh, becoming active. Once an icon becomes active, you can zoom into it like it is here, and then you click uh, the edit icon. OpenStreetMap has multiple ways you can actually edit, but today we're going to be using a remote uh, process or remote editing access using the ID in browser editor. That's an 
platform and requires internet, but it is really good, especially for beginners who are making very simple additions to the Orchestra platform. So when you click this uh, ID editor button here, you will be given a window that actually looks like this. Uh, over the years, I've actually come to learn that whenever you try to do very straight demonstrations online, always the internet can always fail you. But um, when you click the, edit, uh, the ID edit button, you'll be given a window that looks like this. Um, your screen will open up in the area you've been uh, zoomed into. Um, and when you actually get this window, you can actually be able to navigate around using your wheel mouse. Uh, you can pan and navigate around and just get to navigate and see where you are. Um, and then you say, okay, right, if you know where your school is, you look at the different roads that you have, try to navigate around, but when you know the area mapping in, and this is what really Open Street Map is all about, really using local, local knowledge or really just mapping what you 100% know uh, is, is accurate on the ground. Now, there are multiple ways you can actually um, add this a school to Open Street Map, and you can even really go into detail, but today we shall try to keep it simple to make sure that we uh, get the really key simple basics. So, adding a school um, comes in different shapes and sizes. You can add a school as a point feature, as a point location with a single X or Y coordinate. Um, and with that, you just have to use the buttons here at the top. Um, when you see your window open up, you'll have the point icon, the line, and the area icon. To add a point, uh, point a school as a point, you just need to use the point feature icon. You just click on that point feature icon or press one for shortcut. I know a couple of IT gurus may always want to use shortcuts when they're actually mapping. Always keep on zooming in much closer to the area you're looking at. For this case, I am looking at uh, around this building here. This is where the school that I do know um, from experience and also being on the ground, that this is where Wobbles your primary public primary school is located. So once I do know the location of where the school is, uh, and I've clicked the icon, it turns blue, just know that it's active, and your mouse becomes a crosshair. So as you see, this just allows you to really pinpoint exactly where you want to place it. When you're actually mapping a school, you always try to place, uh, especially the big, you know, big structured schools, sometimes you just try to place the, the, the point feature in the central, as well as you can, again, don't be very super accurate, but just within the center of the school, just drop a pin, and once you drop a pin like that, it starts glowing, giving you a sense of, okay, you've dropped a pin, you've dropped a point, or you've dropped a latitude and longitude, but what does that point and latitude mean? So on, on your left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a such a feature, such a um, panel appear, where you can just simply search for school. Very simply like that, just a school. All right, and then you actually have different choices. Now, depending on on how you actually going about this, you can use multiple ways you can actually add uh, schools. So one of the ways you can actually add schools to this is, is just typing in a school, like I mentioned, and then it's clicking school. Now, when you click school, like I've done school grounds, okay? If it's a university that you know, uh, you can also type in university. Okay, so you have university, colleges, I, again, you can really go a little bit deeper, but for this area, I know it's just a, a primary school, so just type in school. Right, and then I click school grounds. Again, you can even find more information when you click the icon here, it gives you more information of what a school ground will look like. So a primary or secondary school of pupils typically between ages of 18, uh, sorry, 16 and 18. So it's really good that you get you know, that inside information before you start adding features. So in case you're not sure of what where college or university lands, you always uh, um, click that icon with the eye that shows you the information behind the tag you're adding. So when you click, um, that button, you see that the icon actually changes. It's still glowing, telling you that if you have any extra information, you can definitely add that, but the icon has not changed. Knowing now that you've actually categorized it as a school. And now this is where the local knowledge comes in, an in-depth knowledge that we talked about. Of, do we know the name of the school? Do we know who's operating the school, the yes, address, the street, you know, the different grade different levels? If you know all that information, you amazingly add that. Of course, if you do not know, again, you don't, you don't need to add, um, you don't need to, uh, always struggle because we believe in, in the crowdsourcing platform. You always put what you can, and someone else will add on the legion, the website if they have all the different tags. So many tags can actually be uh, added to this. Hello, can you guys hear me now? Like, yes, we can hear you now, dear. Oh, sorry about that. Um, 
so yeah so hopefully uh you can now be able to add the the name of the school um so i'm going to put in wobble uh just real quickly so, so you bring in the AI booster. Primary school, it's a primary school, so we can add primary school. Okay, make sure you always capitalize the letters and names as well. Operator, I don't know if it's operated by the government of Uganda, but the government operator type that is government as well. Uh, if I know it's a specific person, if it's privately owned, you can always add that and add all the way down to the different information. Um, one other thing we do as once you've added the point feature as well, you can actually also be able to also map the buildings as well because you know, some of the want to know how to help the structure. So being able to add the building as well. So what we usually do as well, no question mark, we also be able to, if we know the extent of the school, be able to add uh, the building structure. So for this case, we use the area. Area encompass the shape of the structure over the area. Again, you use uh, uh, building. If I just use building features here, you go to building, and then you search again for the different types that you may have. You can search for school, school building. If you know it's, it's part of the school and specifically it's for school, uh, you always try to make it as regular as you can. So you just edit. The different buildings. I'm just going to do a couple of these buildings. I want to do all of them, and it's, a, it's actually quite a big school. So we just use the area tag again. And the beauty about the platform it keeps remembering what you last used. So I just click school building again, and then I uh, I press Q on my on my on my PC just to make sure that the structure is regular. So if I've added um, school buildings, I want to maybe uh, top it all off uh, with the icing on the cake. If I do know the extent of this of this school. And I do know for this for this case, but if you do not know, you don't need to go by this. If you know the exit of the school, you can also just enclose the whole area that you know that is bound by the school to actually say this whole area is the school. It's like I've done, and then you just say uh, school grounds. So you are able to actually add the cover the whole area and add it as school grounds. Once you're done with the editing. You have actually really given not only just a point feature as well, but you've added also the buildings of that school and really even encompass the area around that so that the school is serving all the school uh, encompasses as well. Just to always size and structures of the different schools. So some schools are big and a small one, some schools just one structure. So really knowing that is really uh, key as well. So once you've made your edits in OpenStreetMap, the bit about this is you quickly upload this. All right, so you click this quad save. Uh, when you click save, it always grays out the screen. Uh, just really to give you a, a way of capitalizing and, and seeing what you've actually uh, edited so far. Um, with the change set comment here on your left hand side, you're able to add different, uh, yes, the comment of what you've done. Uh, say, I'll say I've added a school. Right, so once I've done that, I'll be able to click upload. And just below here, you're able to see what you've summarized and added to the platform as well. Uh, it's always good always to click to or add someone else to look at your edits and review them just in case there are any errors you've made. Uh, as we are working on this as a global team and a global you know, world as well. So um, it simply wants to click upload, you give it a couple of minutes, upload, but when you click upload here, uh, give it a couple of minutes and it will actually be on the map, uh, ready to be served up like it is here right now. Uh, Wobble is the primary school, uh, already on the map, uh, ready to use and, and check. Um, for more information on how to uh, schools, of the diff of different shapes and sizes, I encourage you guys to go and check out the OSM Wiki, which has a really detailed step-by-step -step guide on how to actually use the different tabs, the quieter features, and the complexities of, I know, universities and, and colleges and technical institutions that are way bigger than the school that I'm just using right now. Um, I'll be adding the link to the chat as well, uh, but that is how simply you can actually be able to add the school to OpenStreetMap uh, remotely. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone, and hopefully that was a very quick deep dive uh, in how to add the trip, uh, add a school to the trip home. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dio. Uh, Jason, um, are you able to share your screen? Yep, sure. Okay, awesome. awesome. Thanks, Dio. Okay.
So hopefully you can, hi everybody, hopefully you can see my screen. Is that okay, Mario? Yes, we can see your screen, looks great. Fantastic, okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a few minutes now to talk to you about uh, survey one, two, three, and, uh, and how we might use it in also an education context and also how we could use it for, uh, for mapping schools or schools data as well. And I want to just want to put um, survey one, two, three into a little bit of context, first of all, rather than just sort of seeing it sitting it's on its own as some sort of isolated sort of data collection app. It's actually, it sits inside ArcGIS Online. And what you can see on the screen at the moment is my ArcGIS Online account in here. And ArcGIS Online is free for all schools globally. And that includes uh, survey one, two, three, and, and many other things in there as well. So, so ArcGIS Online is free for all schools globally as part of our schools program. And with ArcGIS Online, just some, some quick context. So we have some uh, some mapping tools in here. So is our, our new map viewer, and the ability for children and the young people uh, to add their own data, create their own maps, uh, incorporate all sorts of different types of maps and data in, into one place in 2D. We have uh, 3D maps. This is something I've been working on uh, for some schools and some education resources about the, the ongoing eruption in La Palma. And so we have, there's the Palmer uh, in here, and we've been looking at some drone data uh, from the for the lava flow around there. So the ability to incorporate sort of current and almost near real time, real time data into a teaching uh, lesson and a resource. I think it's really quite a powerful uh, uh, teaching tool. And we've got things like story maps, which are also part of ArcGIS Online. And this is a story map I created for a previous webinar uh, for the program. And this is about where we're looking at maybe low bandwidth or offline options for using. Uh, some of these tools in here, the students ask this one that happens to be about uh, students route to school and safe routes to school and this type of thing and trying to get children to think about the local area and what learning opportunities can we create from that uh, from that local experience in there. So just, just going to go back to my my main up just online uh, page. So survey one, two, three is simply an app inside ArcGIS online. And so you can see it is my story maps and there's my, my 3D scene viewer, my map viewer and here's survey one, two, three. I click on survey one, two, three, opens up for me, and I can go and choose to create a new survey. And if you survey one, two, three is about collecting data, you know, you, sometimes on a mobile device, sometimes via a browser, so it just depends what we want to do. If I, if I click on new survey, I have different options, I can start to go and create uh, a survey, some, some templated ones. Uh, there are is, there's a, a desktop based uh, version of this, which is maybe sort of more, more complex. You can do ask more complex questions uh, with survey one, two, three. And I'm just gonna go back and uh, this would be uh, starting on a, a blank survey form. So the ability, the idea here is actually I can, I can start to create my survey form as I want. I can construct questions uh, from this list on the, on the right-hand side. As good practice, I always like to start with a map because we're usually collecting data about a location. And all I did there was pick up the map and drag it over here onto the uh, left-hand side. And I can then start to ask, you know, so I can start to say, you know, uh, where are you collecting data? I can zoom into whatever location I want to go to. I can set the type of map. I can collect points, lines, or polygons as well inside survey one, two, three as well. And I can, so this is my first part of my, my, uh, my question in here. I can choose to actually make this uh, you know, a requirement for the filling out the form. And you can see other options in here as well. And this is essentially how you start to actually work through uh, your question. So I can add in, maybe uh, I can pick this up, take it over, drop it on the questionnaire. And so now I've got a, a drop down list of questions I want, I want to ask. And so you can see it's really easily, I can just start to build uh, maybe I want to date and time in there. And we can just start to construct our survey form. And one of the other thing, interesting things you put in here is an image, if I can see image. Where is my image gone? Uh, there we go, straight in front of me. And so on. And so I can move through this, uh, the, the design phase of my, my, my uh, questionnaire. Uh, I can save it, I can preview, I can publish it as well. So we can, we can preview this. And we can see what it would look like on different devices. And how it reacts. 
And we can also choose how we actually want people to fill out this question and how we want to collaborate with people. And just to, just to let you know, there's going to be some audience participation in this demonstration. OK, so get ready. So if you have a phone ready with you, uh, I'm going to ask you to use the camera in, a, in, a, in a, probably in a few minutes time. So just, just a little warning there, it's going to be some audience participation. So with my survey form, I can choose uh, how people are going to collaborate with me. It's going to just, I'll just save my, my uh, survey. Ah, obviously didn't publish it. Publish my survey. This will take uh, about 10 or 15 seconds. And then once, I've just, once it's actually published, it means I can then choose who can fill it out. So I can actually make, it's just people who maybe who have to log into ArcGIS online or into survey one, two, three, or I can make uh, the public, the, the survey public. So anybody can fill it out and they can fill it out uh, on, a, on a PC or on a laptop. I can fill it out on a phone. And they can collect data uh, in many different places around, around it using the different types of collaboration tools. And what you're doing, you're collecting data in, in real time. So here we go. Thank you. Here's my collaborate tools. And you can see I can choose how we want people to interact with the survey. I can get people to answer a survey via a QR code. And actually, who can submit data to this survey? Who can see it? And various other sort of security options we've got here, actually, who can, who can see the results, who can update the survey. And so the more you get into this, there are many more sort of layers to actually using survey one, two, three uh, to define and create the, the sort of survey form that you want to use. Okay. Now, this is where we come to the audience participation piece. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to jump over to a, another survey I've, I've previously created. And this is about using a survey form just to map the speed or the internet speed, maybe at your school, but we're going to do this for where you are now. And it's supposed to be just a little bit of fun, so don't take this too seriously. And so you can see now, if I've gone to my, my Collaborate tab, I've got the settings are everybody can actually uh, fill in this form. And there are two ways you can fill out this form uh, for me. So this is, this is going to be part of uh, uh, part of our uh, demonstration today. Now, if you've got a, a reasonably modern phone, you know, a few years old, uh, your camera should recognize a QR code. Okay, so I'm going to use my, my phone first of all, and I'm going to just point my camera app at the phone, it recognizes it, gives me a link, I open that up, and there's my survey form open for me. So if people can do that and fill out the, uh, the form, that would be very useful. Otherwise, uh, we won't have any data to look at later on in the, in the uh, demonstration. Now, if that doesn't work for you, in the chat window, I'm gonna put this link, which you can click on, and you can fill out the form. Now the form asks you to estimate to locate yourself, or your school work depends where you are, estimate your internet speed. And also, uh, if, you, if you want to, if you think it's appropriate, take a picture out, what can you see? Take a picture of your workstation, or what, what can you see from your window? And I'm trusting you all to be sensible with this, please. So I'm going to go and do a question now. So I'm going to use my phone, and I'm going to locate myself, allow myself to use the location, and it's going to go back to the survey. Let's find that location. And I'm going to estimate my internet speed. It's done. And I'm going to take an image of my workstations. I'm talking to you guys. I'm going to use that photo and I'm going to click on submit. Now that data's gone from real time from my phone. If I now click on the Analyze tab, hopefully it's more than just me taking part. Here we have the results coming in so far of uh, who's actually completed the survey in there. So from your mobile device or wherever you're filling in your, your information, whether someone's out in the field filling in the, the, uh, the form, this information comes back to you, the creator of the survey, uh, in a ready in a ready format. Uh, in here. So here's the here's the locations in there. Here's some of the photographs that we uh, we, just, we just took. Is that mine? There we go. Thank you. That's not, that's, that's not me. 
So as well as actually collecting the data and coming in real time here, if I click on the data tab, I get other options as well. So here we go, that's great. So we're starting to see some where we are, people around the, around the globe. We can see the estimated speeds coming in uh, here. If I want to, I can export this as different formats into Excel or CSV or KML or Shapefile. I can click on some of these uh, points here and we can inspect the data. It's much better than my view. So the ability to really uh, interact with the data here. But we can also go a stage further than this. And if I was to click, click on um, opening Map Viewer, there's the data. Let's just zoom out a little bit so we can see everybody's, map, everybody's data. I can expand that into a full tab. And I can immediately start to go and map the data. I could set up some some uh, pre uh, uh, some uh, some presets about mapping this data in here, but I can simply go to my uh, change my style. I'm going to map estimate your internet speed, and it's immediately going to go and create some proportional point maps for me in here. And I can go if I'm done, and maybe I want to change the base map to maybe a darker color. And there we go. So there we have almost like near real time data from around the globe with survey one, two, three, mapped instantly. And also it's still saved inside your Arch and Line accounts. And we also have the data sitting in here that you can export to other, other formats as well. So we see a lot of schools globally using survey one, two, three for field work. And I think the application of using this to map my school uh, is a great application as well. So uh, any questions, please put them into the, uh, into the chat and I'll happily answer them for you. Thanks, Mariam. Thank you uh, both so much for the informative uh, demonstrations. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording of this webinar on our website so uh, everyone can look back and, and follow the instructions at their own pace. Um, and we do have step-by-step uh, -step mapping guides in English, French, Arabic, and Portuguese available on our website. Uh, so participants can uh, learn how to map a school directly in OpenStreetMap. Uh, or they can access the survey one, two, three um, and, and share their information uh, through the survey. Um, so I'm gonna see if uh, our panelists uh, are online and if they can hear me. Um, Raya, uh, are you still with us? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll go back to uh, one of the panel uh, uh, questions um, and uh, give you some time to to respond uh, to that, um, since uh, I think you may have lost your connection during the panel um, discussion. Um, so one of the one of the last questions that I had mentioned uh, for the panel was. Um, uh, you know, can you share your experience on how information on school locations can help. Uh, highlight gaps uh, in quality education opportunities, and if there's an example you could uh, you could share with our participants. Okay, I think I cannot uh, un. Okay, my let video. me. You should be able to share your video now. Hopefully. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I will uh, personally talk on uh, the the project that we are currently doing the school mapping project for the case of Zanzibar. Uh, we are conducting uh, with the Suzette mappers. Um, we are collecting uh, data to promote, and the main idea is to promote further and future initiatives in Zanzibar around ICT and STEM learning. So basically, as I have said before, it's not only about location, but we are looking at how this data could be meaningful used by, for example, the Ministry of Education and other organizations like those who come and uh, provide uh, help and uh, come up with the education pro uh, uh, projects to facilitate STEM learning and to provide internet connectivity into our schools. So we are actually uh, involving other stakeholders uh, 
uh, to 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 help uh, them also to 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 uh, to be able to to do what they are doing. For example, there are different uh, pro, uh, tech projects that have been conducted in the schools of Zanzibar. As you know, that uh, the the school facilities or the schools themselves were in poor condition. But you find it, uh, some of the schools, uh, even if the projects come, some of the schools are given priority. So it's also a good idea to map uh, the schools, but with the facilities that they have, also with the current um, uh, initiative that have been done to those schools. Otherwise, the government will, be not, will not be able to visualize or to understand which schools have been uh, like uh, have been gone or have been undertaken uh, uh, which uh, development projects. So the idea here is uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, in addition to the school's location, we are also looking to other attributes that could help uh, those uh, uh, stakeholders who are working directly with the developing education. Of course, for this case in Zanzibar, but it could be for, for any area. Uh, uh, that uh, it's worked upon. So that is uh, the, the main concern. So I was looking into integrating these uh, things that uh, my schools today is doing, the geoportal and S3. We could like uh, have a, uh, build a collaborative uh, project or collaborative initiative in which uh, the students are not only collecting the data because now we are having the data, the data needs to be analyzed the data needs to be visualized. So the government, for example, uh, it's it's much easier to show a visualization map to the government than uh, sending the, the raw data, uh, which is uh, really hard for them to understand. But what we are trying to do is uh, once we have the data collected, then we need to equip the students with the, these uh, visualization tools and skills so that they come up with the something innovative out, out of it. So I can see that uh, this will help uh, in making, uh, will help the Ministry of Education, of course, and the government in making uh, informed decision because now we are having real time data of the schools. So I see it in that angle. Thank you. Thank you, Raya. Um, it looks like uh, Nano had to jump off uh, and is not online with us. Um, so if there are any uh, questions for um, the GIGA initiative, uh, I'm hoping that maybe some of our colleagues who are online can respond in, in the chat. Um, before we kind of wrap up the panel uh, discussion, um, I wanted to see both Raya and Lorian if you have any final thoughts you wanted to share um, with our participants. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think, I mean, I think we have raised a lot of very important points and it's all about collaboration. It's about the community and about enabling um, the students locally. Uh, and I think, you know, the, 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 the tools that we discussed are all available. Um, the will is there. So I think it's a matter of uh, making it happen. And as Raya said, you know, uh, we're happy to collaborate and provide the platform where people can share that information, do more with it and provide it as a platform, you know, for schools to utilize for learn lessons, but also to disseminate that information, not just to the community, but also back to decision makers and help them formulate policy. So I think um, all in all, uh, from my perspective, I'm really looking forward to, to next steps. Thank you. Raya, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, well, yes, uh, re it's, of course it's the same regarding the collaboration. Uh, luckily uh, on my journey, I was able to, co to, to meet some of the guys from the GeoPortal. And from the, uh, I met some of the people from IACJS system. And luckily, my university is, uh, has asked or has requested for uh, IACJS system donation. Because I have seen one question here, it's shown like uh, why are we are using this, uh, why not using um, open source tools? Because mostly, for example, for youth mappers and other open uh, data initiatives, we are using or we are uh, using open, uh, open source tools. 
and it's uh, really hard for us like to use commercial uh, tools but one of the way that we could look into it in, is to how to make this collaboration active and see how uh, the, their programs could help our students so that they gave uh, some license in terms of grant so that we teach our students uh, uh, these uh, um, tools of theirs that are not open source. So we, we can look, kind of look it into collaboration. And in addition to that, I was thinking like, there are so many initiatives that I have seen now uh, regarding the school mapping uh, thing. Of course, everybody is doing it his or her own way. Maybe we have different contexts, we have uh, different thoughts, but I think it's also very important for us to work uh, and come up because uh, we are, um, mo most of the, the, the people are collecting the same information, same data, but they use different tools, they, they are in different locations, but uh, maybe it's a good idea to come up uh, together and see what we are missing and then fill it rather than reinventing the wheel every time everybody's collecting the same data. So yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you so much, Raya and Lorian, for sharing your insights and your experience with us. Um, we looks like we do have some some time uh, for uh, questions. Um, and before we jump uh, into the Q and A session, I just wanted to remind everyone that they can uh, connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to stay up to date about the call to action and future events. Uh, we've also created a Google group for those who are interested to participate and collaborate with us. Um, and you can visit our website at scgstoday.org um, to find more information and access all the resources we have uh, available as part of the call to action. Um, my colleagues will include all of these uh, links in the chat um, as well. Um, so we've been monitoring kind of the chat uh, and the Q&A box and let me pull up some of the questions we have so we can jump right into the Q&A. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, are your mapping initiatives capturing other important attributes such as access to bathrooms, social services, transportation, and other services as well as connectivity access and access to internet? Would anyone like to start um, with that question? And Jason and Dio, feel free to jump in um, if you'd like to share uh, more information about the work that you're involved in. I mean, I don't know sure. if I can uh, answer this question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was actually going to say yes. Uh, when 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 I did share the link to to how we map actually the school in in, in OSM, it actually gets really detailed. We 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 ask about the schools name, the fees they have, the access to housing for teachers, the number of classrooms, we can even go down to the number of, 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 uh, of desks that they have. So OSM is really, really open to actually expanding even the attributes of the house. I'm sure it's yes, something we can go deeper on, uh, but even with the different tools that we've shown today as well, they are very flexible, like some of the tools that um, my colleague as well has shown, um, Jason as well, where you can actually build your own form as well. So when you have really, contextual questions if you want to add on top of the already existing questions people are asking something that you can definitely keep doing um and yeah i'm sharing it out there so i'll say yes um at least we try to go really deep especially when you talk about access to housing for teachers at least uh, access to the fees uh, internet access as well um something we're definitely looking into as well Lorian, um, go ahead yeah, I just wanted to say absolutely very good question because it's it's hugely important to 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 map more than well the locations is an absolutely fantastic start because that's the critical point on the map. But then thinking about what else is around it is very, very important. Uh, and also in relation to other infrastructure, right? So how easy would it be to get one school on the internet? Where's the nearest cell tower? Where is the nearest broadband network? You know, how far away are, are, is this from the school and, and what is feasible to get, you know, a connection going? So, so mapping all that other data and also things like uh, water, you know, a nearest access point to water, you know, how, how much does it take to actually get water to the school in case it's not there yet? So, so really looking at that further picture, not just the point on the map, but actually the 
entire community around it is, is really important. And that can be easily um, accomplished using survey one, two, three as well. We can extend the survey. It's not just the point data that gets collected. You can collect other information as well. Maybe Jason, did you want to um, uh, comment on that one? Yeah, Lauren, yeah. Um, I think the well, survey one, two, three, as you've seen, you can, get, you can capture what data you want to. Uh, so it's really what's important to you and your community uh, and create the, the forms to do that, really. Uh, I think the flexibility, flexibility is there for you. Uh, and so it's free for all schools. So schools being at the heart of their community, uh, you know, use those tools to do that. Thank you. Uh, Raya, I know that you're also involved in leading um, school mapping uh, initiatives. So uh, are you collecting um, additional information or other attributes about the school facilities in your work? Uh, well, yes, as I have said before, uh, in addition to the, uh, the location data, we are also collecting the ICT uh, data facilities. So there are so many attributes in our uh, form. Uh, we are currently using uh, COBOL uh, collect to, 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 to collect the data. So we are, in addition to the school location, the longitude and latitude, we are also collecting if the students have access to electricity, if they have uh, access to Internet, ac uh, internet accessibility, what kind of uh, internet accessibility is it using? Is it close to um, what kind of road is available uh, at the school? If it, is it a main road or it's uh, somewhere inside? I mean, it's not in the main road. So there are some other attributes that we are collecting in addition to that. As I have said before, uh, because our focus is not only to show the location of the schools, but also to help the have a data set that will be that could be used uh, to to make proper plan in providing internet accessibility into those schools, and also uh, it will give um, uh, government informed decision or the ministry as well, so as to know which school or which area to give priority uh, than the other based on the information that we have collected. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question for Jason and Dio. Um, the participant is asking what tools are embedded or built into both OSM and Survey123 that enforce private protection? Um, so they're asking, uh, are there pop-up messages to remind users to ask for consent? Sure, maybe just to take on that. Um, one of the things that we always do emphasize in OpenStreetMap is adding only information that is what we call publicly needed or publicly available. Not, not any personal identifiable information is added to the platform. Uh, personal names or personal phone numbers are something that we definitely don't encourage in OpenStreetMap. Um, I, I, maybe just can answer for the other part as well in terms of um, um, consent when someone is you know, collecting maybe it's more specific information. Mm -hmm. But for OpenStreetMap, we, we try to focus on information that will be public good and focus on really, um, the, the information that people will be consuming as a public as opposed to personal identifiable information. Yeah, hi, man. So, yeah, the same, well, similar with Survey123, you've got really quite fine grained control over who can actually access the survey. Uh, if the data is, if you're actually collecting data publicly, uh, you're finding way control over who actually can act, then access that data as well. So you can, you can secure this data. Even though I showed you, we were going through and then it was public, that was just for demonstration here. You can collect data publicly, but keep it private. So only the, 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 the appropriate people will actually go and can see that information. So there are a number of tools and, and layers that you can add uh, to the security of the, of the data. Thank you. Um, Lorian, there's a question uh, for you. Uh, what thought is given to the interface between the Africa Geo Portal and other portals such as HDX and those at a national level? 
Yeah, so I tried to answer that in the chat already. But uh, really what we're trying to do is um, to work as much as possible with existing data portals, right? The idea is not to duplicate anything, but to actually work with that data and, and, and rather kind of register it on Africa Geo Portal so that data can get amplified. So really what we're trying to do is, is make that data accessible to a wider community um, um, and a wider user group that we already have available on Africa Geo Portal. Uh, but not just that, the idea then is that the user can take that data and can enhance that data. So you could take the school map, of course, and then you can overlay your own data, which could be data about cell towers in the area. You could add you know, attributes. You can go and collect your own data out in the field and um, add that to the map as well to make that more relevant uh, and share that out again to the wider community. So it's all about amplification and um, making the data accessible to a wider audience, right? So yes, we do absolutely work with um, national uh, portals as well as much as possible. And, and if people have data on other portals, then uh, we work with them to see if how we can get that data in Africa to your portal or link to it by preference, obviously. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question, and I think this may be relevant to, to everyone. And, uh, and that's uh, if you're willing to work with partners outside of the UN ecosystem or ministries um, to, to help fill both the kind of the data gap on school locations and also the digital uh, divide. Maybe I can go first and um, respond on behalf of the, the My School Today uh, initiative. And that is, we are open to collaborating and partnering um, with uh, various stakeholders and participants. So we're working with students, with teachers, uh, with professors, nonprofit organizations, uh, as well as uh, ministries and um, UN uh, agencies. And we have uh, the information about the different partners and collaborators, collaborators we're working with uh, available on, on our website. I don't know, Lorian and Raya, yeah. or even Dio, if you have um, uh, any experience and, and if you can share that with the participants. Yeah, Raya, uh, um, sorry, Miriam, I, we, we work with a, a large number of different entities and that ranges from uh, non-profit organizations to education institutes, research institutes, as well as national governments and um, you know, global organizations, as I mentioned uh, earlier on in the beginning of the, uh, the panel. So uh, we are open to work with, with parties. We also work with um, you know, youth mappers. We work with um, women in GIS. Um, in Africa. So we really want to make sure that the technology is utilized and, and, and really at the core of what Esri does as a company is uh, to try to improve, um, you know, our, our living in this world through, through, through geography. Uh, and we do everything we can in our power to help uh, people learn about geography and how to utilize those tools uh, to make the world a better place for all of us. Yeah, and also maybe just to, to add on to that as well. Yes, we as, as Material of the First Map team and all the same, we kind of do work very closely, with not only in the national organizations, but even the local CBOs as well, because they, uh, CBOs and districts at, at, the low, at, at the lower level, because they even really feel the, the need for, for this information at, at the lower grassroots to really come up with you new know, active. Um, Projects. One of the projects we, we did as what in 2018 was really around OSM in schools, where we were trying to really break that digital divide of, of, of equipment. We, we talked about this here in the call as well, because one of the main reasons we actually map in these schools is to bring services closer. That is power, that is internet, that is equipment. And we were uh, working, we did a pilot around you know, how we can uh, work with schools to actually share equipment, because one of the things we thought of, and, and something that I, I personally saw was. We, we had some you know some laptops and some smart smartphones to, to, to share around and we had to make a decision whether to give one school or the other but then we said you know why can't can, why can't these schools actually just share and if one, everyone books and, and and allows that to that equity of if you don't give one over the other you're not really bringing more equity as well so we felt it wise to actually come up with a system and something that we were hoping to do more of, of, of really having an equipment sharing um system where schools can share among themselves so actually close to each other 
And so being able to actually map out these schools actually will allow us to be able to uh, map out or stress out those, those uh, efficient tools that we can be using to be able to reach the schools more effectively and efficiently. So it's, it's something that we definitely see not only working at the big national level, but even at the local level, really being able to use this location information to deliver services closer to the students and the teachers and, and the institutions around. Thank you. Raya, was there anything you would like to add to that question? Uh, well, I think uh, we are on my side, of course, uh, we are also like for now, we are collaborating with the Liquid Telecom uh, for, for the students. I mean, the students, the Suzuki Mapper students are collecting the data. But of course, we don't want to end it there because we have. Uh, um, we have uh, agreed with them that we are going to share the data. But in addition to that, uh, we are, as these mappers, we are also going to upload the data to the OpenStreetMap. And we are thinking about that because there are some available uh, schools that are there with, of course, with less attributes. So we might need to edit those uh, to make some few edits and then add up uh, the, the ones that are missing. So in addition to that, uh, we are also planning to uh, and we are open to collaborating with the S3, for example, and GeoPortal and other organizations that are willing to train our students so that we they come with the uh, ideas. Now we have data, then what? So the next thing is uh, we are also uh, we also want to um, to train our students to uh, to be innovative. So what innovative solutions that they, they can propose based on the data they have, that they have collected. And most of the students are actually coming from my department, which is the Department of Computer Science and IT. So you find that there are some, they have some knowledge uh, in um, IT related issues. And uh, once they, they, they get uh, these new tools and uh, uh, these new ideas and skills, I'm, I'm sure that they are going to come up with the uh, very innovative solutions uh, to solve the existing uh, problems in the society. And of course, to extend this project, because currently we are doing it uh, in Unguja, Unguja Island, but we want also to go to Pemba and then extend it to the whole Tanzania. So, I mean, of course, this, uh, my school today can help, but as a point, there's one thing that I need to, uh, to, 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 to speak it out. Uh, in my area, the students, I mean, school students uh, in the schools are not allowed to, to go with their phones. They're not allowed to be with their smartphones. So you find it, uh, this mapping initiative uh, for now, it is at the university level because it's there that you find the students are with the gadgets. And uh, uh, with that, we are also having some issues because some of the students are not having smartphones and some of them are having smartphones, but they can, they're going out to the field, but then they don't have, uh, they drain charge easily. So they don't finish their work. And they say like, I couldn't finish because I don't have this. So we are also planning to extend this to buy uh, smartphones, especially for data collection and buying some of the tools that are needed for data collection so that we have it in our, uh, as a, for data collection. So it's specific for data collection. We are giving them uh, specifically for doing that. that, that. Okay, it looks like we may have lost Raya. Um, we can uh, we can move on to uh, to another question and, and come back to Raya. Raya, can you hear us? Oh yes, okay. I think okay. I think the yeah, internet was having some issues, but I think uh, what I was saying is that we are open to collaboration. Susa Mappers, so we are part of uh, Susa. So also Susa, the university is open to collaboration in different areas. We are also working, we have uh, our drone uh, uh, lab that is uh, there and we are having, we are working under the uh, GICT project. So we are having a project that connects uh, between the Department of Computer Science and IT and that of geography. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Raya. Uh, and since you have the mic, I, I might move on to another question that's uh, related um, to your work. I know you mentioned that you're working with the Ministry of Education. 
Uh, and there's a question about how can um, information on school locations become useful to ministries of education if they can't link them easily with their internal school unique identifiers. I don't know if that's something that you can comment on or if anyone else would like to jump in. I think Raya may have lost uh, lost her connection again. I, I um, think, uh, oh. yeah, ahead, just, just to, just to go into that one. From a technical perspective, there's a, there's it's possible to merge data sets. Um, it might need a little tweaking, um, but uh, you know it's 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 something that it's it's doable. I wouldn't say it's it's easy, but um, that depends a little bit on on the data itself and how it's structured and organized, and also how the data is collected. But uh, I'm wondering if Jason wants to comment on that one as well. But it's uh, I, I wouldn't see it as a, a hurdle because at the same time. You know, you're doing a data cleaning exercise, so to speak, to to make sure that the data is updated and, and data cleaning exercises as well always take a little bit of work, right? So I don't think it's a, it's an obstacle that should put everything on hold. Thank you. I don't know if, uh, if Raya has connected. Uh, again, but um, we are reaching the end of the webinar. So I wanted to give all the presenters the opportunity to share any final thoughts or, or comments. Yeah, sure. On my side, I think this is this has really been great being on this chat and really beginning this conversation of, of, of schools, data sets, and I, and I really thank the panel for also sharing the experience and the, and the plans for using this information. Um, one of, I am I'm a very passionate person about when it comes to schools, because I know schools are really a pillar of growth of the country, but even the, the communities around as well. So for me, I truly believe locating a school, giving them a voice is one step forward as well. Um, and also really using that information to bring the services closer and improving the quality of education and really breaking that digital divide. COVID has really shown the, the, the divide we have with some schools, you know, really having online learning and making it seem very easy. Well, other students, you know, um, didn't even have an option to have that. You well, know, going back to the radio, which is also very hard to find in some places as well. So, for me, I think this conversation of getting schools on the map, giving them a voice, really brings those services closer. At least gets gets their voice heard, and and for me, this is really exciting times, and I'm very excited to be part of this. Thank you, Dio. Would any of the other presenters like to share any final thoughts? We have about one minute left. I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I think it's usually important that we give those youngsters the opportunity to 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 play with the technology and to have the technology because, you know, the technology is only going to get more important and there's a lot of things we can do. Yes, there's hurdles and yes, you know, there's there's things that needed to be improved for them to be able to use it, but. You know, they're the future. They're the ones that can teach us in, in a number of years about technology because, you know, they're the digital natives, right? So hugely important um, process and a hugely important project. Thank you, Lillian. Well, um, I would like to thank all of the presenters and panelists, um, and we look forward to our collaboration together. And I'm very excited to see how the participants will get involved and how we can support uh, school mapping efforts um, in the future. Uh, and a big thank you to everyone who participated and tuned into the webinar today. As I mentioned, uh, the recording will be available. So please do check back on our website um, and explore some of the other resources that we've made available as part of the call to action. Thanks once again, and uh, goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.